This is The Wheel Weaves, a Wheel of Time podcast with no spoilers. This podcast is safe for first-time readers because it's made by a first-time reader. I'm your host, Danny, and I'm the one who's taken on the task of reading through this 15-book mega-series. I'm joined by my co-host, Brett, who's a longtime fan, and he's acting as my tour guide on this journey. Before we get into our episode today, we want to welcome Michael Kioski, Mark Timoney, and Cody Feltz to the Wheel Weaves Patreon team. We want to thank you for your contributions, and we're really excited to have your support. And this episode, we're going to be talking about two chapters. Yeah, we have chapter 21 and 22 today. Woohoo! Yes! Okay, hold on there, past Danny and Brett, because you're getting a little bit ahead of yourselves. Turns out you went on too many really fun and interesting tangents this episode, and you weren't able to get through even one chapter. So, this chapter is going to feature the majority of chapter 21, and you can look forward to the rest of it and chapter 22 in episode 19. But some unfortunate news today, while I can drink... Yeah, I unfortunately cannot. So that's too bad. Yeah. Because you threw out your back. You actually herniated a disc in your back. Yeah, it is terrible. Playing soccer. I apparently am getting really old. So you probably just should never play soccer again. Probably at least not for this year. No. (laughs) I think think the worst thing was when I was Googling herniated discs was that it said it's most common in like 30 to 45 year olds and then like 60 years old plus. Yeah. And I'm not any of those ages yet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's just like, yeah, Come on. not so fun. Your but body thinks it's older than it is. Apparently. But good news. You're going to double drink tonight. That's right. So all, right. all of the funny that you won't be, I'll make up for it. Yeah, I'll try not to wheeze too much in the microphone here. So Yeah, does it also hurt you to laugh? It does hurt to laugh, but... So we yeah, just no, that's, that's have a... to just be not funny Yeah. <laughs> with no liquor. Just super monotone. Harry Potter drinking game on hold. At least for me. Yeah. I don't want to see what would happen if you had to double drink I for that too. I don't want to take shots by myself. That's yeah. not fun for anyone. Yeah. That's just sad. So I'm not <laughs> going to do that. <laughs> well, why don't we kick off with a fun fact? Okay, sure. Because this will lighten the mood a little bit. So this one is just a bit of a paraphrased question from an interview that someone had given or read out to Robert Jordan. Oh, so, okay. So yeah, and it's all about maps. And I kind of picked out this one. And I'm just going to paraphrase what was said here because with the maps... You had said that you love maps and we love looking at maps together through different fantasy series. But a question that was phrased to RJ was, had he ripped off Tolkien's Middle Earth map when he created his own? Okay. Yeah, because I mean, there's some similarities sure, in yeah. land masses. Like if you think Game of Thrones map, it's, you know, huge and, you know, looks really different from a lot of maps you well, see. Game of Thrones map is just a map like sideways it's yeah. more north and south than anything yeah so maybe it's different but i mean land masses are land masses mountains yeah. are mountains rivers are rivers the biggest thing is that like in lord of the rings and in wheel of time they're both kind of just square maps okay it's just a big square of land big okay. chunk of land basically sure. okay yeah so that's why the question was phrased but the funny part about it is that Robert Jordan obviously says no, like he didn't rip it off. Like I don't believe this guy really. He's going to be like, yeah, I yeah. ripped it off. <laughs> Next question. That's what like, I did. No. <laughs> but the funny part is when he submitted the Eye of the World to Tor Books, he didn't even draw a map. He oh. didn't submit a map originally with it, and he asked Tor like, why do you need a map? And apparently it was because Tom Doherty, who ran Tor Books, or still does, loves maps. Okay. Which kind of makes sense. Yeah. So he said, okay. I like maps too, because I'm a very visual person, and they just help you understand where the characters are, especially in these quest-type books. Yeah, to see where people are going. Right. Like, Harry Potter doesn't have a map in it. Yeah, because because it's at the school. you literally go from London to Hogwarts and like back yeah and Hogwarts is supposed to sort of be this hidden place in just sort of like northern UK somewhere yeah you're not even really supposed to know where it is yeah you're not going to ask too many questions about where that train's actually going so in books where you're traveling all over the place it makes a lot more sense. sense to have a map just to get a visual representation of where those characters are yeah so when a map was requested rj pretty much it says slapped a couple pieces of paper together 
and drew in the mountains and the countries, he apparently had full maps for a lot of the stuff yeah. that he did. He just had never put it together in a collaborative map. Okay. And then it was so revised. So he never really planned on even including a map in his Originally, book. Originally, no, he didn't. He submitted the book without a map. And it was all going to be for himself. Yeah. But then Tom Doherty wanted one, so he put it together and sent that off. And then it was revised before I, The World actually got published. Right. But that's what we have now. And the maps are illustrated. Yeah. Right? Like, the the maps in the books aren't the Robert Jordan. Yeah, no, I can't imagine that they're his, you know, hand-drawn maps. Okay. But they revised it a bunch of times. But it was his after he was asked to put it together. It's just kind of funny that originally he had no intentions of actually yeah, doing that. Yeah, that is so. funny. Yeah. I'm glad that... Yeah, good the, call on Tom's part. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say, definitely. that's good, because I like those maps. Yeah, absolutely. I actually referred to those maps in did, these chapters. Did you? I did. I'm proud of you. Are you? Why? I well, told you I like maps. But half the time, you also don't refer to the maps. What do you mean? No. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Okay. All right. You'll have to convince me. I'm a very visual person, and you know what? I'm still waiting on the family tree visual for the king of Menethrin. That's true. I was actually going to do that in the last couple of days sure here. Sure you were. Except... You've just been sitting here. Where is my map? Yeah. <laughs> you've literally been on bed rest. Yeah. You've had all the time and you've just been playing games on your phone. <laughs> yeah. And watching TV. Yeah. So, you know, Netflix needs its turn. <laughs> okay. And I did chapter notes. You did chapter notes. But I also did chapter Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and did literally everything else. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll take some credit for that. So this wine is well-deserved, is yes, what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so chapter 21 is called... Listen to the Listen Wind. Listen to the Wind. I'm just going to pull my notes up here because I haven't even done that yet. Okay, so when I saw the chapter title, Listen to the Wind, yep. immediately I said, oh good, Nynaeve is alive. For sure, yeah. Like the Listen to the Wind thing is for sure associated with the wisdom. Yeah, 100%. So the picture too is of a staff, Yep. which is either Moraine's or Nynaeve's. Yeah, traditionally in the last couple times we saw it, we thought it had more to do with Moraine, yes. but... I mean, Maureen's in the chapter, so... That's true. And so I said it's called Listen to the Wind, and the staff is typically for Maureen. Yep. So I thought that maybe it had to do with channeling or something. Because okay. I've been waiting for the naive Maureen interaction. Yes, yeah. Where she finds out that, you know, she could be an Aes Sedai. Absolutely. So. And I think it's so funny that in this chapter, of course, Nynaeve has to find Maureen and Lan... And nobody else. Like, that yeah. That had to happen. I know. Well, oh. I thought that maybe it was brought up. Remember when Maureen and Nynaeve had a meeting together? Yeah. It, with closed doors and no one heard what happened? Yeah. I had assumed that in that time, Maureen chose to talk to Nynaeve. Oh, okay. That's what I thought yeah. had happened. And I thought maybe there was a weird thing that Lan said to Nynaeve that we don't hear. Yeah. So I in thought hallway, maybe yeah. it had to do with that. And so I thought this was going to be maybe a continuation. Ooh, okay. And it's not. It's not. But yeah. that was my original prediction. So do you, backtracking then to that conversation in the, in the hotel, Yeah. what do you think that conversation was? Just trying to get Nynaeve on that board? That was just trying to get information about the boys. Okay. Right? Because she did tell Rand a little bit. Yeah. She's like, oh, who was born outside the two rivers, all that stuff. So that's probably just what it was about. Yeah. It's probably more about the boys and Emmons. Yeah, because she kind of has that dialogue with Rand outside yeah. afterwards. And most importantly, what does Land say to piss off Nynaeve so much? Yeah, I don't know. Have a good night. Yeah, <laughs> something, something like dumb. That. I don't <laughs> just know. literally nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we left off last time with everyone separated after escaping from Shadar Logoth. So Rand, Tom, and Matt are on a boat heading down the river to Whitebridge. Yep. Perrin is freezing to death alone on the other side of the river. Yep. And we haven't heard from anyone else yet. Exactly. So we don't know what happened to Egwene. Right. But here I say, oh, fun, a chapter from Nynaeve's perspective. So yeah. that's new. I really like getting into the head of Nynaeve. I, I like her as a character a lot. Yeah. Some people don't. Yeah, but actually the majority of what I've seen... Nynaeve is people's favorite character, or one of, like, favorite okay. characters. So I was excited to get in her head. Yeah. It's kind of just see like, what makes her tick, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like Perrin, though, where it's very predictable. Yeah. Like, I'm not surprised by the things she's thinking. Like, I wasn't surprised that 
inside parent's head is boring, you know? <laughs> yeah. And well, he's thought- introduced as he- such. Right. And yeah. so I'm not surprised that what Nynaeve is thinking is like exactly what she shows. So is that good writing, do you think? Or maybe. That yeah, you, maybe that that's you what it is. you should be able to figure out what the character's like before you get in their head? Yeah, maybe. Possibly? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm just a really good read of people. Oh, totally it's that. It's totally yeah. me. So. It, it must be that. <laughs> okay, so Nynaeve wakes up alone, holding her horse's reins and leaning against a tree. Yeah. She wakes up with a start when she remembers where she is, and she looks around, and she's completely alone with no Trollocs or anyone around. She scolds herself for falling asleep. So definite consistencies with people, scolding maybe themselves. from Emmonsfield, yeah. scolding themselves, but just people in general just being really hard on themselves. Yeah. And so maybe it's less a Rand deal, and, that, it's, and it's how more of like is? a human trait. Like people are hard on themselves. Yeah. You're more likely to believe negative feedback about yourself than you are positive for most people, I That's definitely say. true. So maybe just in general, people are just hard on themselves. And Robert Jordan does a good job of capturing that in his writing. Because we have three perspectives so far. And they've all been... And all yeah. three of them right away are hard on themselves. Yeah, that's very true. That's a good point. So maybe that's just a note on just the human perspective. Yeah, let's watch for that when we get a new perspective too. Yeah. Well, I want to get in Matt's head because I bet he's never hard oh, on never. himself. Oh, never, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I've done nothing wrong, yeah. especially nothing wrong in Cheddar Logan. <laughs> yeah. That was all Moraine's fault. She said it was safe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, but it turns out, I was saying, she's just as mean to herself as she is to literally everyone else. Yeah, that's fair, too. Like, she yells at everyone, but she also sort of yells at herself. <laughs> so she settled in last night by the river. So she was definitely following the Aes Sedai directions. Like she went to the river. Yeah, that was the original plan. Yeah, and so now the sun is coming up and she can see across to the other bank and it's very sparse over there so she would be able to see if any of the others were over there. But she thinks that the others would have had no reason to cross and they wouldn't be over there anyway. So Nanith thinks about what happened last night and she thinks about how nothing could have prepared her for something like that. She remembers seeing the Trollocs only once outside the walls of Shadar Logoth, and it was a weird encounter. Yeah, we get a little bit of info here. Uh Uh-huh. So, about ten Trollocs jump out at her, and then they basically stop, fall silent, sniff the air, and then they turn their backs on her and run away in the other direction. And so it seems as if they know the smell of who they're after, and Nynaeve thinks to herself that that damn Aes Sedai was right. Yeah, so we get kind of like three really big tidbits of information there. Huge. That's huge to just knowing how Trollocs work and getting inside Nynaeve's head. Because yes. we get like contrary evidence to Nynaeve's thinking a couple times. Yeah. So the fact that Trollocs know the smell of who they're after is huge. Well, and that even though they're relatively mindless killing machines... Like, they're very animalistic. Yeah. They kill for the sake of killing. But when they have a mission, when they're being led, especially by fades, as these ones are... Yeah, I was going to bring up the bonding from a fade to the Trollocs. That probably lends more control. Yes. To make sure the Trollocs do what they're supposed to do. Because if they weren't, like, tied or bonded to that fade... And just as you were saying that, I was thinking about how when the fade died, the Trollocs died. Yeah, so, like, high risk, high reward. But then I was also thinking about how a fade died in Shadar Logoth. Yeah. So that means probably a bunch of Trollocs died, too. Probably 100 to 200 died, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Because I didn't even think about that. But that's, like, less technically that's pursuing them. Yeah, absolutely. That I didn't even think about. Okay, but I also put a star here and said Egwene... Because I was worried that when the Trollocs were chasing Perrin and Egwene, and they were chasing Perrin down river while he was in the river, yeah. I was thinking that Egwene was able to sort of escape upriver away from the Trollocs. Without- because they're not chasing her. Yeah, and this sort of clarifies okay. and confirms that the Trollocs wouldn't chase her. Yes. Now, the big side note that Nynaeve kind of thinks too is like, Maybe they're not going to chase her, but if you get too close, they still might kill you just for being too close. Right. You know? But it seems as though they were very close to her 
Yeah. And left and right. It was like a little bit of a get out of jail free card that might not present itself twice. Yes. So. Well, maybe, but it seems maybe. like they're really after just these boys yeah. and no one else. And that's all that's important right now to Definitely. Them. So the fact that they even went into Sh- Shadar Logoth. Yeah. Just says exactly how important their mission is to them. Yeah, because they didn't want to go in there, but they did anyways. Yes. Okay, so back to Nynaeve here. She sets off downriver on foot, leading her horse with her. So we get some insight into her being able to track really well. She looks for signs of the others, and she finds some tracks, but they're all sort of a mess, and she can't really tell who made them, and there's no clear signs of which way anyone went. Yeah. And we got an introduction that she's like one of the best trackers in Two Rivers. Yeah. Except for Tam Tam Althor. Yeah, because her dad taught her right. That's right. Sure, that's it. So after four miles here, she smells wood smoke and ties her horse up and sneaks up. Yeah. To check it out. She doesn't know exactly who it might be. Right. So it turns out dresses are also not very good for sneaking. Yep. And I'm just wondering how long it's going to take her for, to, for her to like ditch, ditch the, the skirts. The dress. Yeah. Because yeah, right away I'd be like, oh man. So she comes across Maureen and Lan. And then I just put a side note, yay alive. Yes. So they Well, we kind of, like I always assume that they're not going to get capped in the first <laughs> half no. a book here. No, most likely not. But yeah. it's also left a little bit unspoken. So It does, yeah. And I didn't know if maybe they had like found Egwene mm-hmm. at, or if they had like where they'd be or if... Yeah, who knows really. Right? And yeah. so it's just them. So Nynaeve stays hidden and eavesdrops on I love that, that too. Yeah. It's so funny. Of course you don't want to go right up. Yeah, well, I want to hear what they're talking about. Yeah, I was also really excited to see how Lan interacts when, with Moraine when no one's around. Yes. Because he's a little bit soft-spoken or silent when she is around. Yeah. But, like, how open how does do he get? How do they interact yeah. together? Yeah. yeah, it is interesting. So Lan had gone out scouting and is just returning. And I said it's really convenient that we get an update on what's going on. Like, Nynaeve yeah. sneaks up just as Lan's returning. To, Super convenient. To share the news. So the Trollocs and the Half-Men are all gone. Yeah, not dead, just gone. Gone. And the Half-Men set out to go south, and they did that a couple hours ago. Yeah. So Lan finds it really odd that there's no sign of the Trollocs, though. It's like as if they all vanished or something. And like even the dead ones and the Trollocs aren't known for clearing away their dead. Unless they're hungry. Yes. So we do get confirmation that they eat their own dead. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes, if, if they're hungry if enough. If they're hungry. Yeah. Well, and I mean, they're like weird monsters. So yeah. Like, that's not... Does it matter? Well, and they're like, they're very animalistic. Yeah. And like animals will eat their own dead if they're hungry enough. Yeah. So... Even if they're not hungry enough sometimes. Yeah. So that's not even that weird for me. But this whole thing about Trollocs essentially vanishing, I noted it. Okay. I don't really know how any of this is happening and i can't really put anything on it but how are they but it but if they're able to move so many into one place so quickly yeah and if they're able to remove so many out of one place so quickly like there's got to be something happening here absolutely and we got this conversation on a smaller level from maureen and lan already when they were talking about if they had enough why didn't they attack everybody all at once in Emmons field and if they didn't have them, where did they come from? Right. And how, how did they, they come by? down so unnoticed? Yeah. And so when Nynaeve was thinking about the Trollocs coming up on her last night, yeah, there was an interesting sentence where it says the group of Trollocs seemed to spring out of the ground, not 30 paces from her. Okay. And the entire last chapter, I actually kept thinking to myself, they're very sneaky, these Trollocs. Yeah. Because they keep on, quote, lunging out. From places. From yeah. places at them without really being heard. Okay, so what's this idea that's forming in your head here right okay. now? Okay, well, they're able to just like appear and vanish. Okay. So, and if they can just like sort of appear and spring out of the ground almost. Sure. There's got to be something more happening. Okay. Like I I don't have... Don't quite know what. I don't know what. Do they have a good tunnel system under the ground? No, Brett. I think it's magic. I think it's something because then Moraine sort of starts to talk about... She does dip into a couple things. A couple things, but a little bit later on. Okay, so let's, let's wait and come back to it. Okay, because there's something here. Yeah. I can't wrap my head around it even a little bit. Okay. But there's something. 
Yeah, but I think you're absolutely right about the fact that Lan is not happy about this because he can accept the fact that a hundred Trollocs got into the two rivers. Yeah. And it's like, hey, shit happens basically. Yeah. And, you know, a hundred snuck through. But apparently there was over a thousand, thousand yeah. in the hunt last night. And where did they all come from? Because they weren't there before. They couldn't have been there beforehand, before Terran Ferry. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so at this point, Moraine starts to make some tea. And Lan goes on to say here that there's no sign of the boys or the others. And their tracks are too muddled to make anything out. And this makes Nynaeve smile. Because Which is hilarious. she came to the same conclusion and she thinks... That like the warder failing makes her failing There's okay. Definitely some competition breeding. Oh there. Yeah. yeah, and it's just like stop comparing yourself to a fucking warder. Yeah. Like who are you? Lady? Different level, yeah. Yeah, but still, she's really, really comparing herself. But anyways, yeah, so Lan is feeling very concerned about the sheer number of Trollocs. And he says that there must have been over a thousand. And again, more with the how could they have come so quickly and unseen. And then I just put in brackets magic maybe. Yeah, maybe magic. <laughs> so, yeah. so only one fade and a hundred Trollocs were sent into the two rivers, and more were sent only after they crossed the Terran, once it was known that that would not be enough. So whoever sent the fade and the Trollocs in to, I guess, capture these boys, yeah. thought that that would be enough, and all of a sudden, we need it's more. not, we need more. So they more. send more. So this is the line of reasoning with the whole magic that you're bringing up is that, you know, maybe it is through a magical means, but we know that this magic system, there is a set of rules and we can kind of assume that Maureen is knowledgeable and skillful. Yes. She, we've heard her brag a couple of times about she can do things that like not 10 other women in the tower could do. Right. So if the Trollocs are using a magic system to do this, it's, it's stumping Lan and Maureen. Yeah. Right? Which so is interesting. Yeah. And then I also did have a thought recently about the dark side magic system. What do you mean? I'm going to relate it a little bit to Star Wars. Okay. Because so the Jedi are capable of using the force. Yeah. But so are the Sith. Yes. Okay. Right? But the Sith use the force for a bunch of evil. So it's and like so a they, different... It's almost like they push it beyond the mean like they push it further okay. and can do more with it okay because more or just different it seems almost more okay because you're willing to break you're willing to just sort of do anything okay like the reason that anakin ends up going over is because he's promised that he can save someone from death yeah right like whether or not that's true yeah it's, and we've heard that whole save someone from death already. Right. Yeah. So it's like, is the magic system the same, but just sort of on the dark side, they're willing to push it further than on the good side. So let me bring up this as a counterpoint. In the prologue, we saw Elon heal lose Theron, but he said, my healing is a different type of healing. Right. And it was super painful. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Okay. Like, is it the same sort of magic system or is it just like different magic altogether is it like evil magic versus like good magic no oh, okay and i mean like i know the word magic whatever yeah, yeah, dark is it side, different light channeling side. Yeah. is it like channeling the true source in a different way and are they capable of doing it differently than on the good side that because is a good question in harry potter and i mean i'm not taking a shot by myself so <laughs> we're just foregoing <laughs> but for all intents and purposes the Magic is the magic. Yeah. And there are the unforgivable curses. It's the spells you're not that willing to use. Good people yeah. just basically don't use. Okay. And it's dark magic is still a part of the same magic system. It's just people on the good side of it. It's like the morality are that holds just you not back. Okay, okay with splitting their soul by killing people. Well, you, you know, know that's their mean? choice. But so. that's yeah, well exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But is it, so I'm, I'm just curious about how the good side versus the bad side works, works okay. with the channeling system in this universe. Yeah, that's a great question because that all, uh, would also help explain why Maureen and Lan might be getting stumped here. Yes. Okay, yeah. so you don't really have an answer for me at all, really? I, is what I, you're have, saying? I have the answers. I'm not going to share them. But you're not you. sharing yet. No. Because nope. apparently we'll find out. Yeah. 
at uh, some point. Okay, well, that's fine. So, back to our story here after that tangent. So, Moraine is worried here. And they both sort of think about how if the boys are not found, the whole world could be overrun with Trollocs in just like a matter of years. Yeah. And Moraine really has no answers for Lan. And I said, I said, this is just like interesting because she says that capitalized. Ah, the, you took note. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm a good yeah. student, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> she said the ways are closed. Yeah. And that there hasn't been an Aes Sedai powerful enough to capital T travel. Yeah. Since the time of madness. Is this like teleporting? Yeah, so let's break this down real quick. So the ways are closed. There's no glossary definition. But I did want to ask if you had any ideas about what the ways might be. But we can presumably think it's some sort of... Teleportation. Yeah, way to get around. Yeah. The ways. But who knows what it means when it says they're closed. Yeah. But we have seen that word travel. Mm -hmm. So Luz Theron travels in the prologue. When he's trying to escape Elon after he realizes he killed his family. Right. And that was an instance of teleporting. Yes. Essentially. Teleporting, definitely. So the time of madness is the time after the breaking of the world. So yes. right after that event. So there's nobody powerful enough. So they've lost that ability, essentially. Yeah. We did hear Maureen say earlier in the book that there's lots of talents that have been lost completely. Yes. And Aes Sedai are overall weaker now than okay. they were. Yes, we did hear that. Yeah. And then I just put a little prediction note in here sure that like maybe the dark one has figured a way okay like figured out something like has access to that stuff yeah what? I, not has access to but maybe is powerful enough yeah to teleport or quote travel yeah trollocs move, move trollocs right yeah. or like bob the balls guy yeah, right? yeah okay or it, whoever like i'm still so confused about this whole dark one yep. father of lies thing but I'm just going to put it under a dark... Just a big umbrella. Like a dark magic umbrella. Okay, sure. <laughs> I'm putting it under this as maybe they're just powerful enough. Yeah. And they've never really had reason before. To execute the plan, the Order 66. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's it. Okay. But, or they've never really had reason to travel or teleport with Trollocs before. Yeah, well, and, that makes sense. Like, and if now there's nothing... they have a reason. Yeah. And so they're using it. Yeah, I'm totally good with that prediction. Okay. We do get a nice little tidbit from Maureen as well, saying that unless one of the Forsaken is loose. Right. Then hopefully no one that can. never happens. Yeah. But she also doesn't think that the Forsaken could move a thousand Trollocs, but this problem has to wait for now because they have to find the boys. Yeah. Like, big picture, what do we got to do first? Right. And I think that's just a funny little tidbit that we just get all of this information. Yep. Maybe a Forsaken's loose. She doesn't think they could be that powerful, but I don't think that she's been yeah. alive. Or maybe she, I don't even know how old I said I are. Yeah. Which is a whole nother question. That's a whole nother, yeah. It's a whole nother thing in itself. Rabbit hole. And this but episode let me... shouldn't be eight hours long. <laughs> let me just wrap up this little connecting tidbit with one reminder to what Lan said when they were entering or when they were in Shadow Logoth. He said, if the Fades are pushing the Trollocs to go into who's Shadow Logoth, pushing who's the pushing the Fade? Who's pushing the Fade? Right. And or so, Fates. And it's obviously the higher-ups on the, higher the dark ups. side. Your manager is on your butt yeah. to get this done. Mm, didn't you get those TPS reports? Oh, yeah. Shoot. I'm actually going to have to come go in on ahead Saturday. and ask oh, no. you to come in on Saturday. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Back to this. So, see, this is what happens when I drink too much wine. Yeah. <laughs> is we go off on a million tangents, but that's okay. So, Moraine has been searching for the boys while Lan was out scouting. Yes. And she knows that one of them is across the river and alive. And that is? Perrin. Perrin, yeah. But she doesn't know who it is. Yeah. Which is interesting that she doesn't know who is who. Yes. We do get confirmation about the theory. Yeah. About the coins. I said yeah. this is for sure those coins because she also knows there's a faint trace of two of the others going down the river, but it's faded away and the bond has been broken for hours. Because? They gave their fucking coins away like fucking morons. Exactly. Right. There we go. So, yeah, but it is really funny that she can tell and she knows the bond is broken and she knows whereabouts, but she doesn't know who. Yes. Yeah. So, so she can't put like a separate oh, tracker. Sorry. Yeah. No, that was just the end of my thought process. Yeah, it's not like separate, like 
parent tracker. Yeah. When especially when she did hand them out, she didn't even really know who they were. Yeah. So how could you really also makes sense why separate? What Ewan or Ewan didn't get the same kind of coin? I like Ewan McGregor Ewan, way better. Yeah. He's Ewan. I know in the audiobook it's Ewan. I don't care. Ugh, I just but, don't okay. care at all because he's Ewan McGregor and that's all that matters. <laughs> how do we get him to be on the TV show? Ewan McGregor would be good in the TV show. Who would he play? Tim. Oh, yeah. And then I had another question for you about if there's going to be accents on the TV show. Oh, yeah. If it's going to be like <laughs> British accents or... It's that the make-believe fantasy accent that yeah. all TV shows have. Yes. Yeah. So that'll be good. But yeah, Ewan McGregor. Yeah. And Tam? Okay. How, how do we make that happen? Yeah. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> Ewan McGregor at gmail.com. <laughs> all of these guys are just at mac.com. <laughs> there are way too many office references yeah. <laughs> in this episode. So I think this might be a pretty good time to take a break and plug another really great podcast. Hey, Internet, let's talk for a minute about what you're going to do when this episode ends and you're all caught up on the wheel weaves. Interested in checking out maybe a new podcast? Well, here's a promo for a pretty great one. Everybody has a story, and not all of those stories are clear black and white issues, even when we think they are. We wonder, how did this happen? Or what is that like? Or what happens next? Are you sure you really want to know? This is Ignorance Was Bliss at IWB Podcast. So, back to Nynaeve. Yep. crouching and listening from behind a tree and all these things that they're talking about so maureen's talking about she knows where the boys are and lan says that maybe the half men who are heading south have them but maureen says yeah perhaps yeah which is kind of scary that they just have no idea but she's not willing to accept the, that the possibility dead. that they're dead yet right yeah she also says she does accept that Xia Guo will hunt for them and she also expects that the White Tower might oppose her. Yeah, so let's break this down. Because there are always Aes Sedai who accept only one solution. Yeah, so this is like really critical again to Maureen's perception. Because when Maureen and Lan were talking about going to the tower, Lan said, I only trust half of people in the tower. Right. Essentially, yeah. right? Very paraphrased. Or in Tarvalon, he In said. Tarvalon, yeah. he only trusts half of people. He, tr he trusts nobody outside and only half of people within the tower. Yeah. So it makes sense to Morin that Shale Ghoul is going to hunt them. Like, that makes sense. Yeah, because clearly the Dark One wants them. Yeah, yeah. totally. It makes sense that the bad guys are going to do that. But the Tar Tarvalon people, the Aes Sedai, supposedly are all on the same side. Yeah, well, supposedly. Well, on supposedly. The, supposedly on the light side. Yeah. But like that could mean many what things. What does that mean exactly? Yeah. So opposition from within the tower, even the Amaralyn seat, the head of the Aes Sedai. What do you think they would be opposed to and what do you think that one solution is? Well, they would. the one solution is just kill them. Kill yeah. who? Well, the, the... Kill the boys? Well, or what do you... see, that's not really clear here. Yeah. I don't know if Moraine is already understanding that one or more of these boys are probably going to be able to channel okay. at some point. If she does, she hasn't said it out loud where we can hear yet. That's correct. And maybe the solution is you kind of like the red Aja where you like yeah. basically gentle them, but then most likely kill them. They cut the men off from the source, but that eventually turns to them dying. Dead. Yeah. So... Obviously, the one solution yeah. is just like, if anything causes us trouble... You gotta kill it. We just so, kill it. So maybe that's what some Aes Sedai... There are always some Aes Sedai who think that's right. the only... Or if the Dark One wants it, I oppose it. Yeah. That's what she keeps saying. She does. So maybe there are some Aes Sedai who are so much for that, that it's like anything that the Dark One wants, they're just gonna destroy. So that he can't have it. Without even a conversation. Yeah, which would make sense why she's hesitant to... Her if there's issues about going to the tower. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. And at this point, Moraine looks over right at the tree Nynaeve is hiding behind and says, Mistress Almira, you may come out now if you wish. 
Yeah. And this reminds me of the time she looked right over at Rand when Rand was listening in. Oh, but we thought that might be because you stepped on a stick. Yeah, probably not, though. Okay. Maybe. Because this, later on, it's explained that it has something to do... She can feel. She can feel and sense. Yeah. Oh, but then as I talk, maybe that's the same thing. Okay. Because if Rand is able to channel as well, maybe she can sense that. Okay. I don't know. I don't Possibly. Un- I don't know. I think that she sensed that someone was there. Yeah. And right away she knew it was Nynaeve. Yeah, Which definitely. is interesting that she knew it was Nynaeve and not Egwene. Because she calls her by out by name. She does. But maybe Egwene wouldn't stop and sneak in. Listen, she would just come right up. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's just Maureen being really good. Yeah, just knowing people's, you know, way they act. Yeah. Okay, well, anyways, she knows she's there. Yep. So Lan looks over surprised. Like, Lan didn't know yeah. that she was there. Lan doesn't like being surprised. No, he didn't care for that. But Nynaeve feels a little bit of satisfaction about this. There's huge competition. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. So she's quite proud of herself for things like this. And I think it's just funny, again, how she compares herself to a warder. Yeah. But... Nynaeve takes the confrontational route here. Yeah, good job. Go on the offense, right? Storms right up to Moraine and says, What filthy Aes Sedai plots are you planning to use these boys in? And I went, Okay, Nynaeve, calm down. Yeah. So Lan steps... Which is funny because she just confirmed that she believes that Moraine's telling the truth about what's happening. Yes. Because the troll looks like sniffed out the boys. That's true. Yeah. But she also has this thing where she goes back and forth in her thoughts a lot. Definitely. So Lan steps in here between them and puts his arm up to bar her way. Like as if Nynaeve's going to like attack Maureen or something. Yeah. And she tries to cross it, but he just like doesn't allow it. And I just sort of picture like when you put your hand on someone's head when they're trying to swing at you. Oh, yeah. Like a three yeah, stooges yeah. almost. Yeah. And then like, but she can't get her. Like She can't get by him. Yeah, yeah. that's what I picture and I just laughed to myself. But his muscles were like iron. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but Maureen. No, just me? Okay. Yeah, just you. So Maureen doesn't even act to this. Like she doesn't even react. She just offers Nynaeve some tea. And Nynaeve acts really pissed off and says, no, I don't want any of your tea. I would not drink your tea if I was dying of thirst. And I think this is a funny thing that she says because I actually thought that Moraine might have been using some of Nynaeve's herbs to make her tea. Okay. And it's I, possible, And I yeah. just think it's so hypocritical. Like if she wants Moraine to drink and eat her herbs and tea. Yeah. And like she won't even consider touching Moraine's. I don't know. Like it's just Nynaeve's so... Nynaeve's got some like ingrained hatred towards Aes Sedai. Oh, for sure. It's just like all of it, really. Yeah. Like all the Two Rivers folk. Plus, she's like already a stubborn person. Oh, yes. So that doesn't, doesn't help. help. No. Yeah. So she says, you won't use any Emmonsfield folk in your dirty Aes Sedai schemes. This is one thing to think, but she is so bold to like yell it in an Aes Sedai face. Yeah, when Lan's like standing there. Are you joking? Yeah. She's nuts. Because let's let's just say hypothetically that Maureen and Lan are intending to use them in some, you know, isodized scheme, scheme like and what Nynaeve's are you getting in the way. Do yeah. to stop them, like Nynaeve. there's nothing stopping yeah. Lan from dispatching Nynaeve right here if that was the direction. You know what oh, I mean? Oh yeah, and you're in the middle of the forest. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. You're in the yeah. middle of nowhere, literally beside a river. Yeah. No one would ever know. There was literally Besides a fight the fact last night. Maureen could like incinerate you probably. Yeah. If she wants to. So. Yeah, and with like one swoop, land could just like kill you dead. Yeah. And then they just throw your body in the river. And if anyone asks, Charles got you last night. Yeah. It's literally, she's not very yeah. self-preserving in yeah. her actions. Yeah. At all, actually, she's yeah. very confrontational, and it doesn't really serve her here. No. But good for Moraine for being, like, overly patient. Yeah. So. so Moraine, very nonchalantly here, says that you have very little room to talk wisdom. You can wield the one power yourself. And Nynaeve is so incredulous and says, why don't you try claiming I'm a Trolloc? Yeah, knowledge bomb here for Moraine. Yeah. So I'm really excited for this. So I've been waiting for this conversation. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you guessed this a long time ago. Yeah. And we get confirmation now. So, But, I mean, all the signs pointed towards that. But... Still, good job on... Me? Yeah, you good job. Yeah. yeah, okay. On predictions. Yeah, okay. So, Maureen smiles, and Nynaeve gets so mad that she wants to hit her. Yeah. 
So Moraine goes on to explain that she can sense when a woman can touch the true source or channel the one power, just as she could tell with Egwene. So she says, how do you think I knew you were behind that tree? Yeah. And then Lan looks down at Nynaeve in a way that she doesn't like. It's like, a new way of looking at her. Like he's surprised and speculative. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting that... Maureen didn't share it with Lan? Yes. Yeah. Through all of their conversation, she never once sort of said, there are two I could sense in Emmonsfield. Yeah. Right? Well, she might have said there's two, but she never specifically Nynaeve. didn't say Nynaeve. Right. Why do you think that is? Well, I don't know. Well, if I guess if she has this bond with Lan where she can sort of feel what he's feeling. Yeah. Like maybe he's, she knows that he's like impressed by her. Okay. And like feels differently towards her than other random women. Okay. I don't know. Because you don't think there's a romantic thing between Maureen and Lan. No, I don't. Yeah. But no, I don't know. That's okay. a weird one, I guess. Yeah. It's just an interesting thing that she never brought it up. And now Lan's looking at her a little bit differently, so... Right, because Lan clearly holds Aes Sedai in huge standards. Yeah. Well, he works for one. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't even say works for, but... You know what I mean. Yeah. yeah, like he's bonded to one. Yeah. Anyways, so Nynaeve is so upset kind of about this that she says, I won't listen to any more of this. And Maureen cuts her off and says, you must listen. And she goes on to tell Nynaeve what happened when she visited Emmonsfield. Yeah. So how she talked to the villagers, what they said about her. And turns out Nynaeve is able to cure people who like shouldn't be cured. And she's so young with so much skill. Yeah. And Nynaeve is annoyed that people in Emmonsfield talk to an outlander about her. Because she was like having none of that. No, they gossiped about me. And she's all upset about it. Now, we did have previous conversations about what listening to the wind might be. Yeah. And we definitely were, well, I say we, but you definitely hypothesized that it had something to do with the power. Yeah. And... So she says here, I'm just going to cut you off because I think I'm going to talk about yeah, this okay. right away. So Nynaeve says that Mistress Baron taught me well and Lan's eyes are still just sort of like making her uncomfortable, mm-hmm. which is funny. So Moraine says that unlike most women who claim to listen to the wind, you actually can. But it has nothing to do with the wind, of course. It's the air and water. Yeah. So that's more just sort of mentioned to how the power sort of works. And the elements involved. And it kind of makes sense that weather would be air and water. Yeah. Yeah. Because the atmosphere and everything like that. But the interesting part was that Nynaeve is going through that this phase where she is really good at predicting weather and crops and everything. And then she's going through that bad phase. Yeah. And she didn't predict, predict the long winter. And everyone was getting mad at her because she was getting things wrong. Yeah. So... What are your thoughts on why she's getting it wrong? Well, I think I've already mentioned this. I okay. think that there is something happening in the world, okay. whether it is the forsaken so being loose or the dark one being like free. Off. Everything's off. Okay. Even where there should be signs of spring, there isn't. Everywhere. Yeah. Like it's not just where they are. It's not just like a El Nino or whatever it's called. Yeah. Or, or whatever the thing with the mountains is. We live right beside the mountains. I should know. Chinook. Chinook. Yeah. Like where it's warmer, you know, sometimes and it's not, doesn't just have to do with where they are geographically. It's literally, I think, everywhere. Yeah. Because we heard last time from the captain of the ship that he had to winter in Saldea because the river froze early. Yeah. And he couldn't get out. Yeah. So I don't think that it's her. I think that it's definitely something's something's happening. Okay. But maybe that's added to her, like, stress and why she's even meaner than normal. Yeah. Because she doesn't like being wrong and she's someone who's, like, really good at what she does and all of a sudden she's not good at it. And a lot of this seems to be intuition because when Maureen says that she can wield the one power, she says after a fashion. So clearly Nynaeve doesn't have a full grip on this power. It's something that happens sometimes. Yeah. Because she can't always cure people, but she sometimes can cure the crippling injuries and she can sometimes you know, do all these things properly, but she doesn't have full control. Yeah. So Moraine actually tells Nynaeve here that it's not something that she needs to be taught. It was something she was born into just as it was born into Egwene. Yeah. So interesting because Nynaeve missed that whole thing where we saw... We did the interaction between Egwene and Moraine. Right. Yeah. And so we, Nynaeve missed that. And I don't know if she was ever sort of 
told about what Egwene is up to lately with this whole I'm gonna be a nice Sedai business? Yeah, maybe not. And yeah. so this might be Nynaeve's first understanding or first like being told. Yeah, like Egwene formal education also towards this. Okay. Can talk to the wind and also maybe touch the power or whatever. Yeah, because they might not have brought that up at the inn. Oh yeah. Yeah. I doubt that too. So apparently Nynaeve has learned to control it where Egwene has yet to do that. Yeah, so Egwene needs that formal training or it'll be easier for Egwene if she gets formal training versus Nynaeve's method of just struggling through and figuring it out. Right, which she obviously has done because she probably, I mean, realistically has 10 years on Egwene. Yeah, so. possibly, yeah. So Moraine here says that... Nynaeve still really isn't accepting of what Moraine is trying to tell her. Yeah. So Moraine brings up their first meeting. Yeah, and she's just kind of like laying down the evidence. Right. Yeah, that's really what all this whole thing is about. Yeah. And so she says, remember our first meeting about how I asked you if you were the wisdom. Yeah. She like stopped, she cut off what she was saying and like blinked and was surprised. Yeah. And then Nynaeve then sort of remembers this meeting quite well. And it's funny because we got it from Ewan McGregor's point of view. Yeah, exactly. Right? And it was like, oh, it was so funny. Yeah. She called her a child. Or at least I think that's who yeah. it was, right? Or something. We got it from someone's point of view in yeah. Evans Field. Yeah. Because um, they sort of watched it go down and was like, oh, shit. I'm surprised she didn't thump her on the head. Well, that kind of leads back to the whole calling her child thing. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, Moraine addresses her as child, but then suddenly blinks as if surprised and all of a sudden asks if she's the wisdom. And that's mm -hmm. how Nynaeve remembers it. So Nynaeve sort of shakes her head like, no, 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 this is impossible. And she thinks Moraine might just be like trying to trick her. Yeah, but like to what end? Although like, why? Why yeah. would she? That doesn't even make sense. So she thinks that she already knows there's something different about her, and she just doesn't really want to admit it to this Aes Sedai. Yeah, well, Nynaeve hates Aes Sedai, clearly. Yeah, she just doesn't trust her at all. So now that she is essentially one of them, yeah. in a way... Yeah, that's not going to go over well in her brain. No. So that's what becomes quite obvious here as this conversation goes on, because they sort of do this back and forth while Moraine is explaining about how what would happen if she was able to do something for the first time. Like she really knows that she shouldn't be able to do. Yeah, well, so. Moraine is laying down evidence of what a woman's first experience is like. Yes. And this is kind of where it comes back to the whole touching the true source is very much like puberty. Oh, right? yeah. Like yeah, okay. most women could probably explain to another woman what like having your first period is like. Sure. And for guys, similar things. Like I yeah. could explain what yeah, most yeah. things are, are going to be like to another guy. Yeah. So this kind of sounds like Maureen is telling Nynaeve what it, what happens and Nynaeve's just like reliving what actually all of happened. All things that happened. And it all her. matches up. Right. Okay. That's a good way to explain it, actually. But there's definitely back and forth, especially because we're in Nynaeve's head right now. Yeah. Because she's like, oh, the villagers must have told her about these things yeah, okay. that happened. Well, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I totally missed that point you made that that's where Harry Potter, yeah. we totally know where JK got her idea. You for... think so? Oh, I mean, it's like exactly the same. It's literally exactly the yeah. same. And RJ wrote this a long time <laughs> before she did. So... <laughs> A little disclaimer, these are all yeah. our own thoughts. <laughs> Please don't sue me, JK Rowling. <laughs> don't putting you on blast here. Yeah. But, but yeah, it sounds really similar. So if you, something is, you wanted or needed similar. more than anything. And that's okay yeah. because in fantasy, it works. there's all these tropes yeah. and everything is similar. But at the same time, it's like a branch suddenly falling where you could pull yourself out of a pond instead yeah. of drowning or a friend or a pet getting well when everyone thought they would die. And I Or like said, teleporting onto the roof of a school right. when you're being bullied. Or vanishing glass yeah. on a snake cage when your when you're... bully cousin is being yeah. an asshole. Exactly. Yeah. So I said this is exactly 
what happened last chapter with Rand's yeah. encounter with the or, boom swinging across to save him from the Trolloc. Yeah, a ship boom crushing a Trolloc. Or what else? Or like a horse running faster. A horse needing to run faster when it's carrying the girl you like. Yeah, maybe. But also, my whole point is that Wayne also, the whole Bella running faster thing, I'm going back and forth. Yeah. Because... Of who is it? Of who is it? Mm -hmm. Because Egwene clearly has the powers. Absolutely. And probably can make things like this happen as well. So, I don't know. Okay. And then this is the next most critical piece of information we get. Because Maureen then goes into telling about the side effects. Right. Right? The reactions. So you feel nothing at the time. And then a week to ten days later, you have a reaction to touching the true source. So things like fever, chills, headaches, numbness, exhilaration, taking foolish chances, acting, acting giddy, giddy, or spells of dizziness. So let's let's backtrack. Who did we just see yeah. acting super giddy and having lots of headaches? Rand. And then he took all those foolish chances yeah. with the white cloaks. Yes. And that was 10 days after what? In Bear Lawn. Yeah. And if you backtrack about 10 days... That was when they were initially leaving and riding through the middle of the night. Okay, so if his first encounter was this whole thing where he could make Bella run faster. Then about a week to ten days later, he's in Bear Lawn with massive headaches, taking foolish chances. Right, and I actually did, I think maybe yesterday or today, I went back and I read that paragraph. Yeah. Where he tells Bella to run. Light, run, Bella, Light run. run. Yeah. And he says that he feels as if his bones are going to like split. Like he feels it in his body. Mm-hmm. But it's also just all in context with like the icy wind and yeah. all this stuff going on. And yeah. So this is going to be the true test. So if that in fact was yeah. Rand... And his reactions are similar to what a woman would experience. Yeah. Because we also don't know if men and women have experience things the same the way. Same. Yeah, because I thought that his like first touching yeah. was him like standing up to the sky or whatever. But that also would explain Matt's dumb, foolish decisions. Exactly. In that chapter in Shadar Lava. So do you think that Matt... Matt also had an experience that we just like... Either missed or didn't that see. I missed yeah I bet you didn't miss it so that's a good question because <laughs> and I mean Matt could have just been a du- could be being a dumbass yeah but he was acting odd yeah but this is the big question then so we just saw potentially Rand save himself with the boom swinging out and crushing the trollic that was just about to kill him yep and we know that reactions happen seven to ten days after touching the true power touching the true source right but she also says that like later on she describes about how touching the true source and the reaction get closer closer together and closer together until they happen at the same time and that's clearly when women who don't get found yeah that's when it when they die when well yeah that's when the timer starts once the reaction and the touching happen at the same time the timer starts in yeah. air quotes. And it's like the longest she's seen in yeah. five years, but it's usually like less than a year. So this is the question then. We just left off on Rand saving himself, presumably with the power. Yeah. So we should see in about a week's time, if not a little bit less, him acting giddy, taking foolish chances, having right. headaches. And we also know that about a week ago, Egwene touched her first source. Now yeah. we, she did it with the help of an Aes Sedai. So will she have the will negative reactions? Will she have the negative reactions because... Because maybe not. Maybe not. But maybe. Right. So it's something but to look for. Moraine did say that she wouldn't have like the unpleasant side effects. Yeah. So maybe would. Egwene won't have that. But we can look for those signs now to see if these theories are actually correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. All of this is so interesting. And this is all kind of depending on... I didn't on... expect this like <laughs> boring conversation chapter to be so interesting (laughs) well the fun part is so we're getting this from maureen's perspective of what it's like for a woman but does that carry forward to a man exactly that's the other side of the argument yeah and i would say my guess is yes 
Okay. Because everything she's describing is literally exactly what's happened to Rand. And presumably Matt, actually, too. Possibly. So, okay. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I would say, yeah. I would say it's the same. And that's probably how, you know, the Aes Sedai go out. There are some Aes Sedai who go out looking for women. Yeah. You know, they're, and, and it's described later, like, this whole thing goes on, this whole conversation. There's so much information. And we're sort of skipping ahead and all over the place. But... Moraine tells Nynaeve some, you know, we go out looking for these women mostly to save their lives, but, you know, sometimes to boost our numbers mm-hmm. and change the perception of the world and all these different things about yeah. why we go looking for these women, but we also do it to save them. Yeah, the and ones so, who are going to just die without her help. Yeah, and so she, they clearly can go out and help them and so maybe they also know how to encounter men, right? And who looking can for channel, the signs. And they're looking for those signs as well. So it might be similar or the same. Yeah, very, very true. Okay, so Nynaeve actually remembers something like this happening to her. But she shakes her head anyway, like it has to be a coincidence. So Moraine just like keeps talking yeah. and says... Like if this isn't enough to convince yeah, you... You must have used the power to heal Perrin or Egwene at some point. So this is interesting. Very interesting. Because apparently you can sense the presence of someone that you've healed. In Berlon, Nynaeve went straight to the Stag and Lion. And even though it wasn't even like a little bit the nearest into the gate, that's where Nynaeve went. Yeah. So Moraine deduces that... It must have been Perrin or Egwene because they were the only ones at the inn when she yeah. showed up. And it's really interesting how it says develop an affinity for mm-hmm. that person when you heal them. Because we've seen Moraine heal lots of people in Emmons Field now. Oh, yeah. Because if you do develop an affinity for every, everybody... Oh, I didn't even connect that! But, knowledge bomb time, Yeah. we've seen one specific person heal someone else as well. Back in the prologue, we saw Elon heal lose Theron. Right. Okay. So also, oh my God, you're dropping so much on me right now. But that's it. That's it. Yeah. That's all we get. Does that you know mean that there is an affinity developed or a connection or a connection? Probably. Who knows? Probably a connection or affinity. That was a long time ago, and possibly we already had this conversation about dark side versus light side of the power. Mm-hmm. Is it the same? Mm-hmm. Does it carry forward? But I just thought I'd point out the fact that we have seen some people heal other people yeah. in this series. Well, and like most notably, when you said that, what stuck out in my head was Tam. Moraine and Tam. Mm. Mm. Also. Mm. New stepmom, New presumably. St- <laughs> <laughs> so are you shipping Tam and Moraine? I am right now. Oh yeah, my goodness. that's what okay. I'm doing. <laughs> the internet's going to explode there. I love it, though. Okay. Oh, little Aes little Sedai stepmom. Yeah. So cute. Why not? Yeah. Tam deserves to be happy. Yeah, I I would agree. And I like Maureen a lot. Okay. I think that would be a good pair. And yeah. She's so pretty. She is. She dresses up real nice. She is so smart. More importantly, good. I like this. <laughs> this is totally happening. Oh man. At least in my fan fiction, anyway. Okay. Okay. Where were we? <laughs> so Nynaeve found Perrin and Egwene. Yeah. At the inn. But Nynaeve doesn't even have, like, a retort for this. She just mumbles that it was Egwene. Yeah. Like, she already knows. She's conceded. The end. Yeah, Moraine right. wins. Ding, ding. Yeah. Round over. So this kind of starts to make sense for her because she could always tell who was approaching her from behind when she couldn't always see them. And so now she's realizing that there's a reason her cures always work well beyond their expectations. Yeah. And she explains about how Egwene had something called breakbone fever. Yeah. And she was the wisdom's apprentice at the time. And she was really young at the time too. Yeah. So the whole thing about breakbone fever is that it looks really bad, but the person will get better. But she thought that the wisdom at the time, who she was apprenticing under, was like lying to her. Yeah. And thought Egwene was going to die. She was dying, yeah. So she did her crude control of the power you know without really knowing it yes. turns out and it's almost like wishing a horse to go faster and then they do exactly something like that if something you like wish that. a toddler to get better from a fever yeah and then they do something happens right 
Yeah, when the wisdom actually came back, like an hour later, the fever had broken and was actually very surprised. Yeah. But then about a week later, Nynaeve got a terrible fever, but by supper time, it was gone. And so this is all confirming everything Moraine just told her. And Moraine explains that Nynaeve was quite lucky because she managed this crude control over the power. And if she wasn't, it would have killed her eventually. Yeah, and we get a crazy stat too. Like, well, she also says, just like it will kill Egwene if Nynaeve manages to stop her from going to Tar Valen. Yeah, so women like Egwene need that training. Yes. Because it's going to happen one way or the other, and if you don't learn how to control it, you die. So Nynaeve is essentially lucky that she's so stubborn. Yeah, and we get that crazy stat that of four who have the inborn ability like Egwene, three of them die if yes. not trained. Right. So that's sort of like going back to why Aes Sedai are sort of out searching. Yeah, huge mortality right there. That's crazy. Yeah. And again, this just drills down with Nynaeve because she knows people who have died like yes, this. exactly. So her, the previous apprentice before her, and then also apparently one like recently. A young like recently. wisdom's apprentice in Devon's Ride yeah. who died in this way. Like recently. Right. Yeah, so the touching and the reaction happen closer, closer, closer. Once it's almost at the same time, timer starts and then... Basically, and Nynaeve really doesn't want to believe any of this, but she definitely witnessed this happen to Mistress Baron's first apprentice, like before her. Yeah. So that's crazy. Yeah. But Moraine tells Nynaeve that she has great potential. And with yeah. training, she could become even more powerful than Egwene. Which is a huge deal because apparently Egwene could be the most powerful Aes Sedai they've seen in centuries. So that's a huge knowledge bomb there. Yes. Yeah. So this brings back to the question of how did Moraine know that it was Nynaeve behind the tree? Right. We know that Moraine can feel... A woman who can touch the true yeah maybe she source. could feel that it was like like power levels power levels or maybe she could feel that it was more mature mm -hmm. like she could control it yeah like if she can feel random wild so star wars star wars thing? question yeah could was it qui-gon feel anakin's power level when he was a kid like did he know he was going to be one of the most powerful was it something well, like that? Yeah, and then they tested his blood, and he had like the most metachlorian okay. count. I'm just wondering if it's do, something like yeah. that, where there's a connection of you can tell how strong someone is. And how strong they're going to be. Or how strong they could be, yeah, potentially. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, it is probably similar to that. And most people probably don't have an answer for you because they always just skip over episode one. Yeah. And that's where all that information <laughs> is. Yeah. Okay, well, this is funny because. We thought we were going to be able to do two chapters in this episode, but turns out we're not even going to be able to get through one before we sort of run out of time for one chapter here. Yeah, so I'm going to blame it on the Star Wars and the Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings references. Right, and I'm going to mostly blame it on the wine <laughs> on my end. <laughs> That's fair too. But we are going to stop things for this episode for now. And we're going to pick up where we left off for next episode. And we're also going to continue on to and complete chapter 22. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good plan, I think. And we're going to put it into motion. But for now, this is all definitely part of the pattern now. I think it is. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Wheel Weaves. If you'd like bonus content, exclusive insider looks, and to support us making great content, you can find us on patreon.com slash the wheel weaves podcast. Please feel free to rate, comment, and subscribe. It would really mean a lot to us and does actually make a really big difference. Tell your friends or anyone who might like us or anyone who's thinking of getting into the series who might want to follow along with us. You can find us on social media. There's more information on there and some fun pictures and tidbits on Instagram at The Wheel Weaves Podcast or on Twitter at The Wheel Weaves Podcast. Thanks, as always, to audionautics.com for the music and thanks to you awesome listeners.